Hi, I'm Joe Rodriguez, CEO of Metal Ninja Studios and the writer and letterer of the Dust County Chronicles Nightfall. Uh, you can find us on MetalNinjaStudios.com slash links or the Kickstarter at MetalNinjaStudios.com slash Kickstarter. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, Ruin Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course... I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator. He is, of course, the CEO of Metal Ninja Studios, coming to us with a brand new, not only Kickstarter came, but an amazing comics as well, too. We're joined by the ever-talented Joel Rodriguez. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, Kurt. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's good to have you on. You know, I always get the occasional message from, from a variety of people. And of course, the podcasting and radio community is rather small in its own right. Blake, of course, from Blake's Buzz, sent me a quick message. He goes, hey, I got a great comic guy that really needs to be on your show. His name's Joel. He has Dust County Chronicles and a Kickstarter campaign. Can he come on to Two Geeks Talk? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? Let's have some fun. <laughs> 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 so thanks. So thanks so much for coming on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me. And I need to uh, be sure to let Blake know that this was his huge success because honestly, uh, I owe a lot to him without his support as my marketing manager. I wouldn't be on these shows mainly just because I don't take the time and I'm horrible with social media. So my social media presence is not there. So without having great people like Blake vouching for me and saying, no, trust me, he's a good guy. No one will know. <laughs> <laughs> he's done a good job. So I appreciate that. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Oh boy. Depends on how much time you have. So... I started in the industry in 2019. January 2019 was when Metal Ninja Studio started, and it was basically a tax shelter for my creative ventures. I was an accountant by trade, hated every minute of it, and decided that I wanted to move into comics just to enjoy what I was doing a bit more. Um, I wanted to start as a writer, and I wrote a short story called The Fiend in Me, and that short story was for an anthology. Basically, it was my first foray into writing comics. I submitted it to an anthology and they turned it down, said it wasn't a good fit for what they were doing. And I decided I had two options. I could either continue moving with it or I could shelve it and move on to something else. Well, I decided to continue, and that became the f opening short story for the Dust County Chronicles, uh, which is a horror anthology series that has uh, nine short stories spread between two issues, and each one takes a tale you know and love and throws a horror twist on it. Uh, so through that process of creating the Dust County Chronicles, I decided to do what I now tell people not to do, and I taught myself how to letter a comic. I did it for the same reason why everyone else does it, where they were trying to save money. Well, thousands of dollars in fonts and courses later, I have saved no money, but I did thankfully find something that I'm good at in the industry, I'm passionate about, and I really enjoyed doing it. I taught myself graphic design, um, both lettering and graphic design through self-guided education. Um, no formal education, but um, a lot of practice, a lot of trial and error. And people started seeing the work that I was doing and they would see the Dust County Chronicles and they say, oh, who letters your book? Well, I do. Oh, cool. Can you letter mine? Sure. And I had never thought about doing work for other people freelance, but I was thrilled at the idea. So I gave it a shot. And then I kept going from there. More and more people came, more and more people asked me to letter for them. And within two years of starting Metal Ninja Studios, uh, again, which was originally just a way for me to publish comics, it became a um, my job. Uh, within two years, I was doing it full time. Um, and that was all through word of mouth. I've mentioned previously, I am horrible with social media. <laughs> so there was no social media marketing and I didn't have an actual marketing budget. So there were no Facebook ads or anything like that. It was just uh, word of mouth and referrals. So about two years of doing it full time and I worked my way up through Scout, um, through 
a uh, connection that I had with Scout. I got in as a production designer, worked my way up to head of design, did that for about a year. Then I ended up leaving Scout to focus on my freelance work because I was getting to a point where my freelance work was being jeopardized by the work that I was doing for Scout. And I had all of these clients that had put their faith in me for their books that it didn't feel right to me to essentially let them go to the wayside. So I said goodbye to Scout to focus on my freelance clients. And then one of those clients uh, was Merck Publishing, uh, which started a comic about two and a half years ago called Miss Meow. And I was the letterer on that book. Ooh, their need for me grew as well. And it got to the point where I was doing all of their production and all of their lettering for their entire run of books, as well as a couple of um, sister publishing companies that they had. So I once again found myself in the position where my other freelance clients were getting hindered by work that I was doing with this uh, second publishing umbrella, basically. And I didn't want to run into the same situation because Merck had basically structured their entire workflow around how I do things. So if I were to leave Merck, it would hurt a company that I had a hand in building the same way that it would hurt my freelance clients. And I couldn't sit well with either of those. And that's when I made the decision to expand Metal Ninja Studios. So if I'm only limited by the capacity of what I can do with my own two hands, the best way to help everyone is to take these two hands out of the equation. And I started expanding my team and expanding the focus of Metal Ninja Studios. So for the past year, uh, what was once just a way for me to um, make my dreams come true has actually become a vehicle for me to make other people's dreams come true. Whether it's my team or whether it's the creatives that we work with, Metal Ninja Studios has shifted into a full service uh, production studio to where we have an offering called Concept to Comics. And we help creators along every step of the comic book creation process, whether it's I have an idea and I don't know how to write a comic, great. We can either write it for you. We can coach you through the writing process. We can find the artist for you. Art is one thing that really the only thing that we don't do in-house. And it's not that we don't have artist connections. It's the fact that art is subjective and relates to the story. Whereas one letterer can change up his style, his or her style to match whatever art they're working with. An artist spends years developing their style. And if we brought in artists, our sales would essentially be us selling our artists onto these stories instead of giving the stories the art that they deserve. So that didn't really sit well with me. So what we do instead is we offer art facilitation where we uh, find artists and vet the artists ourselves and present those to our clients. The artists or the client then makes a choice based off of a couple of factors, their budget, the timelines, et cetera. They choose an artist and then we manage that artist. So by working with Metal Ninja Studios, it gives the writers a, an opportunity to do what's very rare in this industry, and that's just write. Because especially with independent creators, they have to write, manage, and pretty much run the entire process. I didn't realize when I started writing a comic, I was also signing up to be a process manager. But that's what it is. And a lot of writers aren't necessarily set up for that and they don't necessarily know how to handle that and especially when you're getting into the industry it's very hard to find information so as the company developed i unveiled our company values and our company values are really the background for everything that we do and those are service over sales uh, quality over quantity and one percent better daily and all of those are ground in lessons that I learned throughout my years in the industry. Um, quality over quantity with that one in particular, by the current structure of the industry, we are very much a commoditized 
industry, whereas no one can raise their rates because they're afraid of going against the market. If you hire a letterer, you're pretty much stuck at the same rate. That's why lettering rates haven't adjusted in the past 20 years, mm -hmm. because if you try and adjust your rates, anyone can just say, okay, well, I'm going to go to this guy. He does the exact same thing, but for cheaper. And that a race to the bottom like that only hurts the industry. It doesn't help it grow. It doesn't help anything improve. And it hurts quality because then what you run into is letterers working on lower rates. And I use letterers because that's how I got into this, but really it translates to every step in the process. Right. Um, but they're so focused on paying the bills, especially if you're trying to do this full time, that you have to knock out as many pages as possible because you're a slave to that page rate. And I want Metal Ninja Studios to be different. So the way that I'm structuring our offerings, the way that we're, we're presenting ourselves to the market as a premium service offering, because everything that we do, you can find elsewhere and you can likely find it elsewhere for cheaper but you're not going to find it all in one spot and you're not going to find all of the value that we provide. So that value proposition is what I'm bringing to the table with us being a premium service provider. Like Blake, we mentioned earlier, he's our marketing manager and he does a, his own podcast, Blake's Buzz. We sponsor that podcast and we use that to leverage uh, media and marketing for our clients to help them get on podcasts and do a bunch of stuff. But I digress. I'm getting off topic. Okay. Um, so back to the values, I want to focus on quality over quantity. So we, um, with Metal Ninja Studios, I don't necessarily care about bringing in as many clients as possible because in doing that i'm essentially feeding that same rotation like right now we're actually uh frozen on onboarding we are not accepting new clients and the main reason for that is because with the rapid growth that we've had over the past year i want to take the time to focus on the clients that we currently have develop our systems build everything out that we need to to make sure that next year when we open up again uh, for our next onboarding window we're prepared to give any new clients the custom um, warm onboarding that they deserve and uh, that's all because I want to provide that high quality premium experience as opposed to just rushing through as many projects as we can. Um, and then there's 1% uh, better daily. With that daily grind of trying to knock out as many pages, it's very easy for people in the industry, myself included. I mean, we talked about, I think it was off camera, we talked about how I don't uh, – really do anything with podcasts i don't even listen to podcasts anymore because i'm so busy right. and um all of that comes down to the fact that you get so stuck in the grind that you stop growing you stop learning and when you stop learning you pretty much can go years with your process being the exact same and there's no improvement well i am a firm believer in constant improvement so the entire team at metal ninja studios myself included has a requirement to do daily continued education it can be a five minute video 10 minutes whatever it is but we have to do something to better ourselves daily so that it compounds over time um and to that end everyone on the team has access to skillshare on my dime because my main goal is to help my team achieve their dreams of working on bigger and bigger comics and whatever their independent whatever their individual dreams are just as much as i'm trying to help our creators uh achieve their dreams of making their books so then the last uh the last value is service over sales and with us offering so many different things it would be so easy for me to just say okay well you need the full service package even though really all you need is lettering that's not what we're trying to do so i cater everything to the mindset of serving our customers and serving their dreams as opposed to them serving me by just upselling whatever i think they need whenever we're doing uh say whenever we're doing a pitch or anything like that it's through a consultation to where i actually talk to them i figure out what they need and i figure out how we can help them and all of that is because my goal is to I've said it multiple times, but to help other people achieve their dreams while 
it, honestly, it has to be mutually beneficial, which is why we're a business, but it's doing it while a, um, making sure that their dreams and their goals are the ultimate focus. Well, there's definitely a lot to, to definitely get into for sure. <laughs> yeah. Obviously uh, when it comes to being a business owner and the same for myself as well, too, like as of a year ago, this is, well, I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years, but realistically, this is a business for me as well, too. So I have free and paid services as well in terms of working with you as a client, what would stop them from a price perspective? in terms of uh, rendering your services? I think one of our biggest limiting factors that I've been working through is especially our concept to comics, um, the full service offering that we have. It's not an inexpensive um, offering because with that process, we are essentially managing and creating the entire comic to the extent that they need us to. And with a lot of new creators, which are the people most targeted by that type of offering, it's usually a hobby. So they're not necessarily set on making it a career. So there's the initial shock of the investment of, okay, when I do this, do I want to invest that kind of money into something that might never go anywhere. Um, so there are a couple of things that we do to kind of alleviate that and to work with them. Uh, but ultimately that's a decision that they have to make depending on their budget. I provide as much information and as much value as I can. And that's what I try and do is add on as much free value and bonuses and things to um, make them feel like they're getting a bargain regardless of the actual dollar amount that's coming out, because that's what people really look for. People are much more willing to pay for something if they feel like they're getting a bargain, as opposed to you getting a bargain just because you jacked up your rates. And that's not what we do at Metal Ninja Studios. Um, The reason that our services can be a bit more pricey is because of the value that we're constantly adding and constantly building into our services. No, that's good. I was always curious about that as from one business owner to another. It's it's difficult not only approaching people, especially if you've already had an existing plan in place yep. for a number of years or you have a, a process that has always been available. And yet when you have to say cut back or when you have to refocus your efforts in terms of survivability, as in, you know, keeping the lights on, it can yep. be uh, uh, shocking to some people when they say, well, it was this originally but now it's this why is that and sometimes you can get people on the wrong side of what your intentions actually are we have to live (laughs) (laughs) exactly it's it definitely gets hard in i don't necessarily want to say my unique position but one thing that i think is somewhat unique about what we're doing here is we're fighting against the actual structure of an industry yeah because literally everything in this industry is determined on page rates, whether it's artists, lettering, coloring, editing, it's all page rates. And it's an exchange of value that is so specific that it's become a commodity. Anyone can go to anyone else and everyone has to pretty much offer the same thing. Otherwise, like I mentioned before, it's that race to the bottom. So what we're doing in this type of bundled offering is we're not giving page rates it or we're not charging based on page rates it's this is the bundle cost so then it's not only a question of wait you used to charge page rates why do you not charge page rates but it's okay well now how do i know i'm getting the value so it's figuring out how to communicate that to where they still see that I have their best interests at heart. And then I'm sure, you know, as a business owner, these prices are not only to feed me, but now I have a team that I have to support too. So I have to make sure that I account for all of that. And yeah, it, it's definitely had some growing pains and it's definitely a fun challenge. I I enjoy it, but it's a challenge nonetheless. Um, Yeah. It's completely understandable. Let's dive into, of course, the, the comic itself here because I think this has been a wonderful eye-opening business discussion. I think we should have you back on later on, maybe next year or sometime, and really kind of dive into the side of the business itself and 
you know, tips and tricks and how to's and all that stuff for maybe a beginning business person. Sounds like a wonderful episode in my opinion, but yeah, I, uh, I would love that. I love talking business. <laughs> we'll get that scheduled in for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Dust County Chronicles Nightfall number one through three, the final nightmare, of course, is a current Kickstarter campaign. And as yes. of this recording, whenever this does get released, uh, it's still currently ongoing. What is that series all about? Because you kind of hinted at it and I'm sure you have an amazing team. It's an anthology. Give us a quick rundown of that and give us some of the people that are actually attached to the series itself. Cause I'm always curious about the talent that's currently out there. Well, the majority of our talent uh, for the series overall is me and Roman Gubski, uh, who's the series artist. One of the fun things about the original Dust County Chronicle series is although it was an anthology, it was still just the two of us. But every time there was a new short story, Roman would draw a different style. So it looked like different people were drawing it, but it was all him. That was some fun play that we got. In terms of other um, talent on the team, uh, the series is edited by Andrea Molinari, as well as David Byrne um, of Stake fame. And then we have a wide roster of cover artists that have been helping us through five Kickstarter campaigns, uh, Ricardo Ficini, Ryan Kincaid, Alex Cormack, uh, Chris Mad. The ones that are currently available with this new campaign are Joseph Schmolke, Francesca Fantini, Chris Mad, and then Roman has two covers. He's got the standard cover, which we call Hunted, and then he has our Kickstarter exclusive cover, which is called Eventide. Um, that one is really fun because um, Metal Ninja Studios is going to be branching into Kickstarter publishing with some of our clients' books uh, starting, ne starting next year. So one of the things that we're starting with this campaign are Kickstarter exclusives, where the only way to get them is through Metal Ninja Studios Kickstarter campaigns, whether that's a current campaign or a future campaign. Um, but with the Eventide cover, the metal version of it is actually a campaign exclusive. So the only way to get that is via this campaign. Um, so we're kind of leveraging two different aspects of exclusivity there, which I think is pretty fun. And so far, people have had a pretty positive reaction to it from what I've seen. But anyway, to tell a bit more about the book, uh, the Dust County Chronicles started as a horror anthology series. And the best way to start the pitch is to ask a simple question. Have you ever wondered what it would be like if Toy Story was a slasher? What about if Peter Pan required a sacrifice to enter Neverland? And that's the basic premise. We take tales that you know and love and throw a horror twist on them but there's even a twist in that and the fact that all of these short stories although they are self-contained each one being four to seven pages they all take place in the same geographic location dusk county and that leads us to nightfall which i describe as the avengers of horror meets cabin in the woods and the avengers of horror aspect comes down to the fact that all of the short stories from the first two Dust County Chronicles issues are brought together Avengers style, pulling characters and elements from each individual story to bring them together in Nightfall and this three issue miniseries adventure, which follows two women, the sister of one missing person in Dust County and the mother of another missing person. Through a series of events, these two women find each other and end up working together to try and find their lost loved ones. Um, but they find that things aren't really what they seem like. Uh, for some reason, the police are severely underreporting the missing people, and they have absolutely no interest in finding those they do report on. So the police are no help. They are forced to go search on their own, and they discover that Dust County is secretly the hiding place of every nightmare you can imagine and by the second issue it turns from an investigative search and rescue to get the hell out of dust county as fast as you can otherwise you won't be able to in issue three we find out whether or not they make it <laughs> wow that, that's amazing i i love i love that twist though that that is something i never really have thought about and i'm sure that people have, who have read at least issue one or anything like that have really followed it as the series has gone on. What's the most misunderstood aspect about the horror genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand? I would say that horror has to be gory. Hmm. There are a ton of different elements of horror, things that we 
uh, approach with the Dust County Chronicles. I mean, there are the gorier elements within the series, but basically with every story, we tackle a different element of horror, whether it's psychological, whether it's body horror, whether it's trauma. We tackle all of that in the short stories, and it doesn't necessarily have to be gratuitous violence or gore for it to be horror. I mean, the gore does help, but it's not a requirement. <laughs> Interesting, Then, So what type of horror do you enjoy and what don't you enjoy? Um, I love slasher movies, slashers and monsters, but I'm not a huge fan of gratuitous gore for the sake of gore. For example, I'm not a big fan of the hostile movies because, I mean, it, it's a lot of gore and it's a lot of violence and stuff that I don't necessarily, it just doesn't sit well with me, yeah. but I love Halloween and all of the classics and right. Nightmare on Elm Street. All, I, I love all of the classics, which are just as bloody. It's just not as grounded in reality, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember seeing it was funny. My very first foray into horror was actually it was Jason versus Freddy or Freddy <laughs> versus Jason in, in, in the movie yep. theater, actually. And I had never actually seen either no nightmare on elm street or uh friday the 13th the series like any of those shows yep. until, until after i saw freddy versus jason because i'm like oh cool two iconic characters i know and love but i never seen their original origins you know yeah i actually the first one that i remember seeing is freddy versus jason i'm sure i saw the others before but that that movie holds a special place for me because that's the first one that I actually remember. Just can't be enough. And it, it, <laughs> it was just can't be enough. It was like, okay, you can suspend your disbelief, enjoy the film for the popcorn inducing yep. enjoyment that it is. And then I kind of go from there. The, cam <laughs> the campaign's currently ongoing, obviously, when it comes to this particular series. What has been the reaction, not only to the stories of Dust County itself from either past campaigns or past issues people have received, compared to your summarization of this trilogy you're putting together from what i've heard people have really liked it i was honestly really nervous with it especially with the dust county chronicles number one this series is about five years in the making i started writing the first dust county in 2018 i released it in 2019 but everyone is telling me that they like it and especially everyone who has read the Dust County Chronicles of Nightfall without reading the original anthology series. They tell me that they like it as well, which is a huge weight off of my chest because I had the hardest time figuring out how to sell Nightfall number one because the Dust County Chronicles was a horror anthology series. So I knew my pitch exactly as I gave it. And then I had to somehow transition from but wait, there's a story where everything comes together, but you don't get to know the whole thing, so you don't get to see how they come together. But now people are actually able to see how it all comes together and how it all interplays and how it all interweaves. And especially if they read – basically the feedback that I've gotten, they read Nightfall the series. Some people say that it feels rushed, which – I can't argue that. I mean, um, as much as I enjoy writing, I am not the best artist in the world or best writer in the world. And honestly, I was focused very heavily on all of the interplay and the weaving. So with all of that, if it feels a little rushed, I'm sorry. Um, I guess you'll just have to come back when I do more. The feedback from Nightfall is, wow, this is awesome. But then the feedback when they read all five is excuse my language holy shit this is awesome <laughs> and basically what i've come down to is nightfall can stand on its own but you get so much extra if you read those couple of issues uh that came before and that's what i was hoping for and it makes me so happy to actually hear other people say it nice oh that's awesome it's great seeing a journey of of a character of or an of idea finally come to fruition to see it in print to physically hold it in hand and then say i did this i made this you know it's those types yeah. of small victories that a lot of times we don't actually pay attention to because we're focused on our next goal yep exactly and uh i actually had to take a moment 
uh, while I was lettering this issue because I lettered the whole series and I had to stop at a particular page and I sent Blake a message and it was like 11 o'clock at night and he knows that I'm a very regimented person like I'm off the computer by 8 30 because I get up at 4 30 um, so the fact that I was sending him a message at 11 o'clock he says okay something's up and he looks at the message and it's me talking about how surreal it is that I just lettered this page because it's a page near the end of nightfall number three that I've been building to for five years. And it's a specific callback to the very first issue of the dust County Chronicles, my favorite panel in the entire first issue. And it was surreal that after five years of buildup and delays and just, I mean, the pandemic happened during all of this. The pandemic happened right after I released Nightfall number one. Mm. And I, like the whole world, I had a downward spiral in terms of my mental state during that entire time frame. And there were times where I questioned if I was ever going to finish Dust County just because I wasn't feeling it anymore. Like my passion was gone. Luckily, it has since come back. A lot of factors that went into bringing everything back, but I'm full steam ahead on everything that I'm doing now. But with that, I finally got to this panel and I let her the panel and it just hit me that this was five years in the making, questioning whether or not I was actually going to get there, how long it was going to take, if it was all going to be worth it, if it was all going to land the way that I wanted wanted it to, if people were going to accept it, if people were going to like it. And it just hit me all at once. And I needed to tell someone and my wife was already asleep and I saw Blake was online. And so I said, hey, and it, yeah, it was it was crazy. And even now, thinking back, I just think of how surreal that moment was. And now when I hold it in my hands after we get it printed and actually look at the whole series, it's going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. Wow. No, that, that's wonderful to see. And yeah, the pandemic definitely hit a lot of people. I'm glad you bounced back and were able to finish this amazing project. You talk about lettering a lot here as well, too. And for someone that hasn't lettered, I mean, I know cursive and I know how to print. That's about all I can do in terms of <laughs> my writing styles. What is the most underutilized font for lettering? And what is your favorite font to use? Ooh, that's a good question. I would say one of my favorite fonts to use is called CC Richard Starking. And it, it's a font from Comic Craft that's actually based off of Richard Starking's hand lettering. I'm such a huge fan of that font. I actually have it tattooed on me. Uh, that's my son's name tattooed in a word balloon. And the font we used was, uh, where is it? Eh, there it is. And the font that I used for it was actually CC Richard Starking. I learned a lot from him just through my research, so it, it fit. As for an underutilized font, hmm, honestly, I'm not so sure that there is an underutilized font. One thing that I see a lot of are really overutilized fonts and underutilized techniques. There's one technique in particular that I'm a huge fan of that people very rarely use and in illustrator which is where i do my lettering they have this panel called the appearance panel where you can essentially take text and put a bunch of different effects on it while leaving the text editable and most letterers that i know of especially when using sound effects and doing the booms the pows all of that stuff in order to do that the common knowledge is you have to what's called outline the text where you essentially make it a shape instead of a letter and then you can manipulate it and do all of that well i found that using this appearance panel and a couple of other tools you're able to create those same effects while still leaving the text completely editable and adjustable so you can take that style and repeat it throughout the process if say for example the script calls for a boom and you do it the old way and you letter it and you make it say boom, but then the editor comes back and says, no, actually, we think it should say pow. Well, you essentially have to recreate that entire sound effect. Whereas with my technique, you have to just change the letters and everything's still there. So yeah, I think they're underutilized techniques more than there are underutilized fonts, in my opinion, at least. What's an overutilized technique that you see just everywhere that really should just go by the wayside? Round balloons. Hmm. 
with modern technology in these lettering programs, it's very easy to add a small little distortion effect to give balloons more of an organic shape to where it's not perfectly round and ovular. Um, but it, it's a telltale sign with a lot of newer letterers. Um, and at the same time, it's easier to set up an oval balloon than it is one of these organic balloons and not many people notice it but the people who do notice it really pay attention to that organic feel because it's our job as letterers to essentially be invisible uh lettering is called the invisible art because really the only time that you notice it is when it's done wrong but in doing that in the invisible art, whatever we can do to make it look more organic and less computerized, the more it's going to blend with the art. Because even if the art is drawn digitally, it's drawn digitally with a pen and paper, mostly like an iPad or something like that. It doesn't come across as computerized. So if you do that and you put all of these perfectly symmetrical organic shape or non-organic computerized shapes on it, 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 there's going to be some dissonance there for your readers and they're not going to be able to explain why it's just going to feel a little off and it's our job to be able to explain why and that's one thing that we can do to make it more organic and make it resonate a bit better i don't get to talk to many letterers to be perfectly honest in, in the 15 years i've been doing this show so i'm just picking your brain kind of just to understand that side of the comic aspect that i i, I think is like you said the, the invisible creator uh, when it comes to lettering is is often underutilized because everyone thinks it's just done really by a computer and away you go. You have to have typography knowledge. You have to have graphic design knowledge. You have to have all of these skill sets that an artist also has, but a graphic designer as well. Speaking of graphic yeah. design though, who are three graphic designers that you, when you were doing your self-study, who are three graphic designers that we should look into as well too and understand why they're so great at what they do? Oh, Man, you're busting out all these hard questions. Oh, I haven't got to the introspective <laughs> questions yet. This, this is service level right now. <laughs> As I was doing my education, I was pulling from so many different sources. I didn't necessarily pay attention to who was doing what. I was paying attention to what was getting done. It's kind of an interesting part about how my brain works with education is I don't just go and watch a course on something. I do things trial by fire and if i'm trying to figure out a technique i'll have an idea and there's this idea that i have that i really want to do but i don't know how to do it so i'm going to go online and figure out okay that's how i do it and now i go and do it and that's pretty much how i developed all of my skills now that i think about it two people that i did actually follow and did actually um watch quite a bit of their courses uh, were Lindsay Marsh and Aaron Draplin. Lindsay Marsh was kind of my first foray into graphic design courses. I started with a lot of her basic stuff, such as color theory and uh, layout design and things along those lines. And then once I got kind of that baseline knowledge, then I developed that mindset where I would just start working on something and then go learn whatever I needed to. And her stuff is on Skillshare and it's fantastic. And then another person was Aaron Draplin. And one thing that I really learned about him is building a brand yourself and doing design for yourself. Like you see the banner in the back, the hat, the shirt, like all of that was from some of the stuff that I picked up with Aaron Draplin, where his thing is he does freelance graphic design, but he has his own studio and his own design where he does his own graphic design merchandising and then uses that to spread awareness for his brand. And that's one thing that I've been working on implementing now that um, I've actually over the past year or so since the expansion done a complete redesign of the branding for Metal Ninja Studios. And now, now I'm starting to build all that out with the merchandise. Yeah. W once you have a logo, it's kind of iconic as the logo you see with Two Geeks Talking was designed by Don Griffin. Uh, she's an amazing, not only comic artist, but she's a graphic designer for over twenty years in the in the Philadelphia region as well. Oh, nice. Um, and so she she was the one that originally designed my my Two Geeks Talking TGT Media logo with 
what you see here and that hasn't changed in 15 years and <laughs> i've had i've had people come up to me and the idea of having a good design and a good logo and a good brand branding i should say for your company is i don't really know anything about yourself but i remember your logo i remember your 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 branding it's just been yep. it sticks in my mind more so than you as a person which yeah a lot of my education especially over the past year or so has been more on the business side than it has been the graphic design side because with the expansion i'm spending more time working on the business than i am working in the business um like Honestly, I don't letter that many books anymore. And when I do, they're passion projects that I take on personally because my job is to make sure that my team has work. So if I'm taking all the work, it doesn't really make sense. And then I can't grow the business. So, um, but one of the things going back to the branding conversation is one of the things that really struck me in my education was branding is nothing more than taking an abstract concept and associating it with you that's basically all that we're doing like metal ninja studios those are three words that have nothing to do with each other but through what i do through the logo through our reputation that association for metal ninja studios will eventually be linked to full service comic book design or full service comic book production and me as a person as well as my team and what we represent those three values and getting metal ninja studios to link to those three values is fantastic because then it becomes synonymous with quality care and education and that's one thing that's really important to me we recently just started doing free education through our metal ninja dojo blog as well as a few things that we're going to be launching on Blake's Buzz. One thing that's really important to me in terms of education, since we're talking about graphic designers that inspired me, is education for the comic book industry is very hard to come by. When I was a writer trying to figure out how to write a comic, I had no idea what to do. And anyone that you talk to, they would just say, well, Google it. And this all goes back to that same commodity mindset that we were talking about before, since everything is so competitive in the industry, people by nature want to hold on to their secrets because if you let your secrets out, you're basically training your competition who will then undercut you in the market. I can't fault people for thinking like that, but that's a mindset that hurts the industry. So what I'm doing with Metal Ninja Studios is we're taking all of that information and making it free to the public. Because what that is going to do is that's going to take the quality of comics across the board and raise them up and raise the entire industry. One thing that I had a very hard time figuring out when I was starting was how to format a comic book script. There are a few references, but there's like five different formats for comic scripts and no one explains why you should use a certain one, what makes one better. It's just... Here you go, pick and have fun. So one of the blog posts that we have coming up probably within the next couple of months is a breakdown of the different comic book scripts that we're aware of, the pros and the cons of each one, and then which one we recommend as a studio. And all of that, we're going to be giving away for free just to help the community that's helped us so much. Oh, that's, uh, that's awesome. I love seeing stuff like that. In fact, I took a two month break from doing interviews actually. And I started doing my own series called Mastering Podcasts and Video Interviews from Geek to Guru, starting from, from the very beginning for my 15 years of knowledge. And I've been putting it into a YouTube series. So that's awesome. It's been fun actually. It's other than doing interviews, it's the most exciting I've, time I've had when it comes to doing my own projects and creating stuff. So, you know, if you have the knowledge, utilize it, use it. I, I love your concept about, you know, training the competition, but to be perfectly fair, we're going to do what we love. We're going to do what we're passionate about and we're all going to die eventually. So yep. you might as well have fun with what your life that you currently have. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Is there anything you want me to ask about or anything you want to share and showcase before I go into my four or five questions? No, I think we pretty much covered it. I mean, your opening question of how'd you get started turned into the pitch about the studio. So it, it just happened naturally. Um, yeah. I I think we're ready to get introspective and difficult. <laughs> oh, I don't know if it's difficult, but they're introspective, for sure. It's, it depends on your mindset. I mean, <laughs> everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? Do I have to pick just one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. I would have to say my great grandfather. He's still alive. He's 94. And he 
is pretty much the epitome of self-care as well as taking care of those you love. Um, my great grandmother, before she died, she developed Alzheimer's and she got to the point where um, she didn't remember anyone and not even him. But every single day, he would go up to the home where she was staying, and he would feed her lunch at the same time every single day. And as she declined over time, it got to the point where she wouldn't let anyone feed her except for the nice man. And that nice man was him. So after 50 plus years of marriage, he be basically became the nice man. And it was a badge of honor because even without her recognizing him, that bond that they had was still there because of the compassion and the dedication that he showed to her in the hard times. And if you can show that type of compassion in the hard times, nothing can break you. And that really stuck with me. And their 50th anniversary ring was actually the ring that I gave to my wife as her engagement ring. Wow, that's uh, <laughs> that, that's touching. <laughs> uh, my you my, wanted introspective. From a professional standpoint, you run a very successful studio with Mendel Ninja Studios, and you great, gave a great breakdown early on. And I hope those that want to take advantage of your services and your knowledge base can do so at your course the website down below. So professionally, you're successful in in many different regards, especially with the comics as well. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Successful, yes, but I don't use that as an excuse to be done. Um, I would say, yes, I would consider myself successful, but not satisfied. And a lot of people may think that's weird or potentially a bad mindset. Um, of never being satisfied. My wife actually gets frustrated with me because she says, you're never satisfied with stuff. And it's true because I have a very strong drive to continue and to improve it. I built it into the founding values of my company. And whenever I have doubts of how successful I am, I always think back to a time when I wanted what I have now. And I remember when I first started writing the Dust County Chronicles, I wrote a little sticky note that I stuck on my computer and it said full-time writer by 25 or by 35. And I started Metal Ninja Studios when I was 25. And the whole reason for that sticky note was everything that I was reading said 10 years to overnight success usually with comic writers they become an overnight success and everyone's talking about them but what you don't see is they've been working for 10 years to try and get their big break and they finally get it after 10 years and it basically becomes a game of attrition where the longer you stay in the higher your chances are of finding success so that was my sticky note and now every time that i doubt myself i think back to that sticky note because January is the five-year anniversary of Metal Ninja Studios, and not only have I been doing it full-time for years, but I have a team of seven people depending on me now. And that really grounds me. And then when people think of success and thinking of themselves as successful, it can tend to lead to an ego, which I definitely do not want. I am not an egotistical person. But every once in a while, people need to keep themselves in check. And how I do that is by thinking about the fact that I'm not done and how much more I have to learn and how much more I have to grow and how much more the studio has to grow. So that's why I say that I'm not satisfied, but I do consider myself successful. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I learn from them and I make sure that I don't do the same mistake again. Um, in my personal opinion, the only time that you fail is when you don't learn from it. Otherwise, it's a learning experience and it's we don't grow without failing. Uh, 
if we go through the entire existence of life without failing, we didn't do anything and we didn't accomplish anything because by definition, when you start something new, you are going to fail. And by embracing that failure, that's how you learn, that's how you grow, and that's how you develop. And the more comfortable you can get embracing failure, then the faster you'll be able to grow because that fear isn't holding you back anymore. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer, an artist, a letterer, or something creative that maybe you've inspired them on their path to do. And the fact that you have the younger generation looking at you as an inspirational person, maybe you're going to inspire them creatively in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Well, I kind of joke with my wife ever since my son was born that he doesn't have a choice with his career. Uh, he's going to be an artist so that I don't have to pay for art anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, all all jokes aside, it, it all kind – this whole introspective kind of draws upon itself and pulls together um, because the same way that my great-grandpa inspired me was his dedication – when things were hard. And then my success was built upon enduring during the downtimes and figuring out how to make things work when it wasn't easy. And then it seems easy because I'm horrible at social media. So I just kind of disappear for a few years and then I come back and I have this huge studio. Um, huge is relative, but anyway, I, I have a studio that's bigger than one. And it's from the outside, it can look like it just kind of came out of nowhere, but it was years of growth and development and pivots and adjustments. And then with what I'm showing my son and what hopefully he'll be able to pass on to the next generation is the real important times in life are when it's hard because life is going to be hard either way. Um, you can either work through the difficult times and receive a reward at the end, or you can not work through it and it will just by nature be difficult. I mentioned, I think off stream that, or it might even be on stream, I don't remember, uh, mm -hmm. but I mentioned that I'm in the middle of a physical exercise challenge. And in July, Metal Ninja Studios did our first charity challenge. And during that charity challenge, we had merchandise that we sold to raise money for intracranial hypertension, uh, which is a neurological condition that my wife was diagnosed with a few years ago. And my part of the challenge, aside from organizing it, was running a running challenge called 4x4x48, during which I ran four miles every four hours for 48 hours. It was rough. And it was not easy but the main reason why i put myself in difficult situations like that is because if i can endure those difficult situations i know that nothing else can keep me down and to go back to my point if i didn't put myself in situations like that if i didn't focus on my health the way that i do i know from experience because over the past year little over a year um i 15 months, I lost about 60 pounds. And that was through the work that I was putting in. And I know that before I lost that weight, it was hard. Life was hard. My mental state wasn't there and times were hard. But then throughout the past 15 months, the stuff that I put myself through was hard as well. But the result is that I feel a lot better now and I got a reward out of it. So all of that to say, it doesn't even have to do with fitness. It's the difficult aspect of it, of by putting ourselves into difficult situations, we become accustomed to the difficulty and we learn to thrive in it. And when we can thrive, that's when we can grow and turn that difficulty into a reward and a benefit in the end. Um, so that's what I'm hoping to pass along to my son and what I'm hoping that he'll be able to pass on to the next generation. Well, Joel, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I, I, If anyone gets anything from this episode, it's going to be uh, education, business acumen, and the fact that, you know, sticking to what you're passionate about and 
surviving after all these years and not utilizing social media is the benefit to being a business owner. <laughs> <laughs> it, the key is stay away from social media. Just if you can stay away from social media, you'll be golden but then eventually you'll have to do it and then i find someone else to do it for me because if i tried to learn it now it would just be a nightmare put, put it in one of your courses in skillshare and, and learn from there there you go there we uh, go <laughs> before i let you go where can we find you how can we support you of course where is this campaign and everything that you would like to share and showcase so the easiest way to follow us is via MetalNinjaStudios.com. We do have a link tree with all of our social media and active campaigns that we're associated with. That would be at MetalNinjaStudios.com slash links. And if you're looking for the Dust County Chronicles campaign right now, it's MetalNinjaStudios.com slash Kickstarter. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number two. Of course, our podcast is back after 12 or so years. You can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com. But if you don't use Podbean, search on any podcast streaming service that you get your podcast at, Two Geeks Talking. You'll find it on iTunes, Spotify, everything like that. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on to Geeks Talking.